Welcome to the Mets Pod presented by Tri-State Cadillac. On today's show, we welcome special guest co-host Jerry Blevins and SNY Mets reporter Steve Gelbs joins us from the MLB Winter Meetings. We'll be talking all the latest news and rumors from the meetings in Nashville and answer your live questions later in the show. So subscribe to the Mets Pod at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your shows. Welcome to the Mets Pod, presented by Tri-State Cadillac. Elevate your style in a Cadillac. Go from bold to bolder in an SUV, from inspiring to awe-inspiring in a sedan. Visit your Tri-State Cadillac dealer today. Here's your reminder to subscribe to the show at Apple Podcasts, Spotify. You can watch on SNY's YouTube channel or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm your co-host, Joe DeMeo. Connor Rogers couldn't be here tonight, so we are thrilled to welcome special guest co-host, former Mets pitcher and current SNY analyst, Jerry Blevins. And joining us live from the winter meetings in Nashville is SNY Mets reporter, Steve Gelbs. Guys, are we having fun yet? I'm having a great time. I, like we were saying before we got on the air, I've got a, a large shoes to fill with uh, Connor Rogers, especially in the hair department. Uh, I'm clearly not nearly as handsome, but I, at least I think I'm pretty significantly taller than him. So I got him on that front. You definitely are. I mean, Connor, people don't understand this, but Connor actually had nothing to do tonight, but he deals with me once a week. And that's part of his contract that he doesn't need to do it twice. Also, Jerry, um, turn that hat around with pride for a second. Jake oh, Brown. For sure. that's, a, that's a big win. All right. So give it a second. And then you can turn it back around. But and I'm also, so by the way, I want to uh, give the people what they what they came for. <laughs> your hair, even when it's a mess, it is really something to be desired. So a lot of gray, a lot of grays, a lot more grays than Connor as well in here. So you got me on that front, though. Steve. Yeah, I was going to say you're still number two. Both of you dialed in uh, within a, the next last couple of days to haircuts. Again, riveting, riveting stuff here. Hey, that's about, that's about all we got going on at the winter meetings right now, to be honest with you. So, so, Steve, as we talk about what's going on at the winter meetings or what's not going on, are things starting to percolate at all down there? Or is it shaping up that it's just simply going to be a bit of a dud of a winter meetings? I mean, do you want me to get people to watch our shows or do you want me to tell you the truth? <laughs> so, yeah, there's, there's nothing really happening. I mean, you know, this is, I don't know if it's like crazy unique that the top of the market stalls things, but it feels like because of how high end the top of the market is this particular year, both offensively and with the pitching side, um, nothing's really moving. And so the, the baseball world is waiting on Otani and Yamamoto. That's what it feels like. And there's no real indication that either one of them is going to sign by the end of these meetings. And so right now, I mean, we, I've, I've been to enough of these where it can change on a dime. I'm well aware of that. But right now it's shaping up to be, you know, very little. And um, I mean, we were coming on here tonight ready to talk about Eric Fetty, which, you know, no, no offense to Eric Fetty, but that I think is not exactly where most of these winter meetings usually go with, with that caliber. So, um, right now, not much going on other than uh, than the hair conversation. <laughs> well, Steve, the one signing that the Mets did get, they're not, you know, there's nothing going on at the winter meetings, but uh, there was a lot of hype and and pursuit uh, on both ends for David Stearns. He was the big acquisition, especially, you know, considering how long they waited to hire one. And without a GM with Billy Epler stepping away, David Stearns kind of steps into that spotlight. How do you think he's filled the shoes? Has he lived up to the hype? Obviously, there's a not a huge amount of things going on, but how do you think he's done so far since he became uh, the Mets president of baseball ops? Yeah, I, I think he's been as advertised. And obviously, we're at the very, very tip of the, the iceberg here. There's a lot more that's ahead and there's a lot more going on. But, um, you know, David Stearns has the reputation he has for a reason. And there have been a couple of things that have stood out to me in our conversations over the last couple of days. Uh, one in particular that I think should be viewed as a really good sign from a Mets fan's perspective. He was talking a lot about needing to leave space open for young players to come up and get an opportunity and to really give them a chance to show what they can do. 
And I think that's so critical with where this organization is at right now, where it's clear that they are thinking more long term right now. That's not to suggest they're not going to field a competitive team next year. They do want to make a run at the playoffs and and be in contention, but it's it's with a long term goal in mind. And I think that sometimes, especially organizations in New York, especially organizations with a lot of money, and the Mets have more money than than any organization in sports, um, they tend to get tantalized by what can help them in the near term. And if there's a guy out there that can make the 2024 roster look much better. Um, but sometimes that comes at the expense of seeing what you've got at the lower levels. And not to make too much of a cross sport comparison, but it's no secret how much of a, a Rangers fan I am. And, you know, I look at what what's happened with them this year. They're the top team in the NHL in large part because they finally let their number one overall pick, Alexi Lafreniere, just have an opportunity to thrive and to play with Alexi Panarin. Uh, Alexi Panarin, that's how big of a Ranger fan I am right now. No, <laughs> Artemi Panarin. Um, sometimes you've got to give talent room to shine. And so that doesn't need to necessarily be right at the, the start of the season, but your Acunas, your Gilberts, you've got to see what they can do. And so the fact that they're being a little more cautious and not saying, well, we're going to go out and we're going to sign a Matt Chapman just because um, that to me is a good sign about what David Stearns is doing and, and the thinking that he has the long-term vision with this team. When you think about someone that can help the 2024 team, Yoshinobu Yamamoto has been, we've talked about him on this podcast for like three months. He's on every show on SNY and it's always just, he's the frontline guy. He's the ace. He's the kind of guy the Mets need to add. Something that hasn't been talked about is obviously where this price point is going. There's a lot of word that it could be north of $250 million and it's not my money and it's not either of your money, but Steve, what do you think should be the line in which the Mets should look to go financially on Yamamoto? Do you cut it at a certain point? Because at, at some point, the risk out, outweighs the reward, you would think, right? No. <laughs> I mean, in most, in most organizations, yes, but not in this one. You know, if Steve Cohen's willing to spend the money, let him spend it. Uh, he, he has so much more than anybody else. And I think when you talk about this situation with Yamamoto – I said it on Hot Stove yesterday. It's just a situation that doesn't exist in the game. He's 25 years old. In seven seasons in, um, in Japan, he had a 1.72 ERA. In seven seasons. We're not talking about one good year. Seven years, 1.72 ERA, the youth at 25. Um, you know, he's got basically everything you'd, you'd want. He's got great command. He gave up two home runs last year in like 171 innings, something like that. Uh, he's a, a, a world-class splitter. He is a, a front-line, top-of-the-rotation ace that you have at your disposal, not in free agency when he's 29, 30, 31, 32. He's 25. He's right in his prime. And so if all it's going to cost is money, and we know that the Mets have an owner that's willing to spend to get that type of talent, then no, there is no line to draw in the sand. And I learned that last year. I know it didn't work out, but you know it was like, well, how much are they going to spend on on Nimmo? You got to bring back Nimmo. And then it just it was like a watershed. They realized, all right, this is what we have to spend. This is what we're going to spend. So not with everybody. You don't want to do that with everybody. But by all accounts, Yamamoto is the type of guy that you want to do that with. So whatever Steve Cohen's comfortable spending, more power to you. Go spend it. Steve, I, I agree with you. I think uh, I think Yamamoto is the exception, but he's the only one out there, the only starting pitcher out there that I would be willing to write a, basically a, a blank check for a 10-year contract, mainly because he's 25 years old. All the other contenders, all the other top end are in their 30s or 30 or right around that mark, and what they're going to get on the open market is different. Yamamoto's 25. He is special. I know there's some question marks with how effective Japan to America can be, but you know, obviously with with what Senga has done, uh, it's definitely a positive sign. But here's the difference for me. I do think that other things besides money play into the factor, and I actually don't think Yamamoto will be a Met. I think mainly the the allure of the the Yankees pinstripes I think is a real deal. 
Um, it's a global brand. I think even the Giants, the Cardinals are are really good players. I think San Francisco showed what they they offered Aaron Judge that they're real players when it comes to the right player. And I think Yamamoto is that for everybody. So if the Mets don't sign Yamamoto, what are some of the other names out there uh, on the free agent market? Some of the other targets that you would you would want David Stearns and the the brass to kind of pursue. So Jordan Montgomery really intrigues me for a number of reasons. He, you know, A, he's he's shown he can do it in New York, and I don't think that that is something that should be discounted. Jerry knows that. David Stearns has talked about that. Like, there's there's always a question mark with anybody coming in if they've never played here. It's just different. And so the fact that he has and has performed, that matters. Um, we've seen what he can do in the postseason as well. So, you know, I think a Jordan Montgomery is intriguing. Um, you know, I've always, I've always liked Rodriguez. Uh, but I also think that if it's not going to be Yamamoto, uh, there are certain guys that are in the similar vein to a Severino that I think work, again, in this structure right now, where they're going to be looking for short-term deals, maybe high ceiling, bounce-back candidates, um, you know, like a Giolito-type guy. I, I just – I think from a Mets perspective, if it's not going to be the guy that you can see really being in this rotation for a long time, then I don't think you want to commit to long term. I think you want to leave, again, room for some of these younger pitchers that showed last year that maybe they have a future um, and can make an impact sooner rather than later. Uh, and so then you go the short term route with guys that maybe have a high ceiling that you hope with a, whether it's your pitching lab or Hefner or whatever, you hope you can get something out of. But in that case, by the way, too, it's also about uh, um, quantity over quality, too, at some point. Like you throw as much against the wall, you sign as much as you can and you see who rises to the top. Before you move on, Joe, I just want to ask what like yeah. some of those names. I agree with you that a Severino type player should be on the horizon. Is Giolito another target that you think would be willing to take a one year kind of make good before he hits the free agent that, market again? Or is yeah, there other names? Cause I, I honestly don't think that Jordan Montgomery, I, I would be nervous signing him to a big time contract because it's the track record isn't terribly long of him being this dominant. I'm not saying he can't be, but to me, he doesn't strike that Yamamoto, you know, even waiting until next year in their free agent class of Wheeler, Corbin Burns, um, you know, if Cole yeah. opts out, he's out there. I don't think Montgomery lives in that that realm. So if you could go after a Giolito type, what, what other names are out there on kind of a short term? You, you know, know, that I mean, I, I don't know the answer to that. That Giolito was the one that, that just popped into my head a little bit over the last couple of days. And I think there was a, a report out there that connected the Mets to Giolito a little bit too. But I think I think he's very similar to Severino. And that's, you know, I think he's going to be looking to reestablish value. I don't know for sure. Um, but that type of a player is where I think the Mets could pivot to. Um, to your point about Montgomery, that's the type of guy that I would have a, a, a red line to, right? If he's going to get, I agree with you, if he's going to get, a monster, monster deal, long-term, big dollars, I'd probably pivot away. But if you can find him in that middle ground, um, him, Rodriguez, those are the, the next tier of guys that I would, I would be interested in. Um, but again, I, I think, I, I kind of think it's more quantity over quality at this point in time with where the organization's at and you try and take flyers on high-end guys and see what they can do. Jack Flaherty, Hinjin Ryu, those are a couple yep, other names that I think are short-term yep. kind of guys. Uh, but let's move to the outfield. You mentioned Drew Gilbert, Luis Angel Acuna, music to my ears. That's what I do. So that, that's the kind of stuff that I'm into. But how would you approach the outfield situation this offseason? I mean, where you look right now, DJ Stewart is basically the everyday left fielder because Jeff McNeil is going to be focused at second base, according to Stearns. And then you have the ultimate question about Starling Marte. Can he stay healthy? So it looks like there's kind of that everyday role available. And on top of that, the health concerns with Marte. How would you approach the outfield as we go across the next month or two? Yeah, so this to me is, is a tougher question to answer because we don't really know just how well Marte is doing. What they're saying is that he's doing pretty well. Um, I think you have to go into next season with a backup plan for sure. 
but I don't think you're going to find somebody on the free agent market that has the potential to impact the lineup in any way, shape, or form like a healthy Starling Marte will. I think that the absence of a healthy Marte last year did not get spoken about enough. Um, we saw two years ago what happened when Marte got hurt that last month and how different this team looked. I remember Eric Chavez saying to me uh, in 2022 quite often that Marte is the key. Marte is the engine that makes this lineup go. If you look at when we have good offensive spurts, good offensive days, Marte's always in the middle of it. And so that type of player being out of the lineup and that type of health, even when he was in the lineup, not being reached last year, had a, a huge impact on this offense. If they're confident that Marte is going to be healthy again next year, then you've got to pencil him in as that guy with a backup plan that's probably going to be more of a defensive-oriented guy anyway, like a Michael A. Taylor. And then I do think you need to leave room for these prospects to come up. I think Luis Angel Acuna, to me, is the most intriguing guy that they have in terms of people that can make an impact next year because he's so got the tool, um, the toolbox that doesn't rely solely on his bat. He can become such a menace on the base pass if he can just get on base. Um, he, he is an MLB caliber defender from everything that I've heard already. So I would kind of go, that's how I would go. I would, I would hope that you can get everyday production out of Marte, that he's going to be healthy. I would have a backup option that's more of a defensive-oriented athlete, like a Michael A. Taylor, maybe even like a Kiermaier guy um, type player. And then I would, I would hope that by May, by June, Acuna can come up and make an impact. Maybe a Gilbert can come make an impact. That's how I would approach it. I don't do minor leagues that well. I don't know that deep. Uh, I'll leave that to you two experts on that. But for the bullpen, it's kind of where you know I wanted to go. I can't believe it took me this long to to talk about it. But uh, we got Diaz coming back. David Robertson did such an admirable job. You know, uh, that first probably two and a half months of the season, you almost, you know, I can't say we didn't miss Edwin Diaz is back there, but the guys filled in so well for so long. And then it kind of fell off and fell apart a little bit. Um, I think when they traded David Robertson, that was the final, like, all right, they're done, you know, trying to compete. Yeah. Uh, he's gone. You have Edwin Diaz. You have basically three guys. You have Diaz, you have Brooks Raley coming back, and then you have Drew Smith, who still quite hasn't established himself as a true back end guy, but he's very more than capable of being worthy of a spot for sure in the back end of that bullpen. Where do you think David Stearns goes as far as looking to the bullpen now? So he mentioned something about the bullpen being open and how that's not necessarily a bad thing. And I think you've seen a lot of these unknown or lesser arms being acquired. And, uh, you know, I know the Mets are very intrigued at least by what they can do now with some of these arms with their pitching lab that they they just opened up at the end of last season. So I think that they're probably more likely just reading the tea leaves to go with lesser known guys and, and have a, a lot of open competition, a lot of open spots. I'm a huge fan of David Robertson. I I think I tweeted out when they traded him last year that my number one priority going into 2024 would be to sign David Robertson back. Um, I don't know what type of an impact the end of the season that he had last year would have on what the Mets brass are thinking going into this season with him. Um, you know, at some point it's going to fall off for Robertson. I, I don't know when that's going to be, but so I don't know what their level of commitment to him would be, uh, especially if, again, they're not, it's not that they're not going for it next year, but they're, they're thinking again more long term. So, um, you know, for me, the 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 guy that you mentioned that I just I sit there constantly and think like it's got to come together is Drew Smith, and I'm glad that they didn't cut bait with him because we've seen it. We've seen the stretch. I think I think it was today actually that Stearns brought that up as well. Where it's like you've seen these spurts. You've just got to find a way to get him to unlock it, and so. Um, you can't rely on that going into next year, but if they can find a way to, to get the most out of Drew Smith, Brooks Raley is a really, you know, solid, solid back end arm. Edwin Diaz will be back. 
And then you've got a bunch of guys that are going to compete. And again, the, the quantity, I, it's not that quality doesn't matter, right? Quality absolutely matters. But I think where they're at right now is find as many different arms as you possibly can with as much flexibility option-wise as you possibly can, and then have competition back there. So that's probably the route that they're going to go. Do you think they have room for, since Adovino opted out, is he still in play for the Mets or, or is he looking to move on from there? I would, I would guess he's going to move on. I, I don't okay. know, but I think generally when you've got a situation like this, when a guy ends up opting out and I think, um, you know, when, when there were certainly conversations and he was open about that, that he had with the front office uh, about maybe reworking his contract and, and what it's going to look like when he then makes the decision to opt out, it would seem to me like there's a, an understanding that this is probably not going to be where he lands. Could it happen? Sure. I know Adovino loved his time here and, and he's a local guy. And so if, if he doesn't find what he's looking for elsewhere, and maybe the Mets don't find what they're looking for. Maybe they reunite. But, uh, you know, if you were to say, hey, you've got to make the call right now. Is Adovino back? I would say no. And one last one for you, Steve. And this is actually a live mailbag question from our YouTube channel, from NY Sports Wicker Media. Steve, how much hot chicken have you had in Nashville? None. Did we talk about this hotel at all? That's, did we talk? No, don't give me, are you giving me that look or are you giving the hotel that look, Jerry? I'm giving you, well, both. The The Opryland is, does have its shortcomings as far as I can't, navigation, but. I'm so scared to leave this hotel because I have no idea how to find my way back once I get inside. Like I've got a little bubble now where I kind of have an idea of where I'm going, how I'm going to get to set, how I'm going to get to my room. Uh, there's a an Italian place that, it took me about 45 minutes to find, but where everybody's currently having dinner without me right now, they've ordered me a chicken parm. Um, but I said, I have to talk to you guys first. I, I, <laughs> listen, it's, it's almost worse to me that this, that this meetings is in a place like Nashville where I'd like to experience the city because I can't, I can't leave. And I honestly, if there's a hot chicken place in the, the Opry land, I haven't found it and I'm not going to go try because I'm going to get so lost. Just so you know, you're in Tennessee. You're in you're in some of the nicest people in the world. So if you get lost outside inside, all you got to do is ask for directions and they'll they'll gladly they might walk you to where you need to go. Uh I asked when I when I got lost looking for the the restaurant yesterday. I did I, I knew I was lost when I had um I started seeing the same things like I didn't realize I had done a full <laughs> loop. And so I asked the guy for directions and he was incredibly nice. Um, but he gave, it was like 17 directions. Like, oh, that's, yeah, that's really easy. So you're going to go out here. You're going to make a left. You're going to see a tree right over there. You're going to hook around it, do a 360, then go. I, I mean, <laughs> it's, they might be nice, but it doesn't prevent what this place is, which is, I mean, I'm just going to be honest. It's one of the worst places in America. I, it's very, it's beautiful. It's, Huge, but the fact that somebody built this thing and expected people to find their way around, you know. <laughs> just happy to not, be here, huh, Steve? Not great. Yeah, yeah. I'm just here so I don't get fined. <laughs> Make sure to follow Steve on Twitter slash X at Steve Gelbs for all the latest from Nashville. And check out SNY's Mets Hot Stove live from the winter meetings tomorrow at 530 Eastern on SNY. Steve, thank you so much for your time. Go get some hot chicken. Enjoy the next couple days in Nashville, and uh, we will talk soon. All right, guys. Be good. You, Your Steve. hair looks great, Jerry. Looks fantastic. Thanks. You'll pump me up. I, I can always count on you, my friend. <laughs> You're listening to the Mets Pod presented by Tri-State Cadillac. Subscribe to the Mets Pod at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SNY's YouTube channel, or wherever you get your podcasts. Jerry, before we get to more winter meetings talk uh, and questions from the audience, we want to quickly hit on the MLB draft lottery, which I'm sure you were very tuned into. Uh, while most are waiting for the decision on Shohei Otani, I was sitting on my couch nervous as to whether the Mets would end up in the top six of the 2024 draft and keep their pick protected. However, uh, the lottery balls did not go the Mets way, and they will pick 
uh, number 19 in the 2024 draft due to uh, spending north of $40 million over the luxury tax. So that there is the penalty. Uh, Jerry, any draft lottery thoughts? Uh, no, I love it. You know, being a part of the the subcommittee, uh, the MLB Players Association, it was always about the teams that flopped on purpose, the tank teams to to try to get the top picks. I think this is a step forward in making sure that teams that don't that blow it on purpose and try to lose 110 games on purpose uh, don't always get to reap those rewards of uh, just, just you don't you you don't want to incentivize making your own fans hate going to the ballpark. And I think this is a big step forward. So I'm, I'm a fan of it. Even though the Mets got all the way back to 19, I think it's a proper step in, in the right direction. And I feel bad for Oakland. They're losing their team to Vegas. They've dropped in both lotteries from where they were supposed to pick. And now in 2025, they can't pick earlier than 10th as a team that receives uh, revenue sharing. You can only be in the lottery twice in a row. So poor Oakland. I, but I feel bad for their fans. They are not a small market. So the fact that they get revenue sharing is crazy to me. Uh, and the fact that they don't spend money uh, is also not, it's insane. It's not, it's not the fans fault that the team is mo moving. Let's just put it that way. So back to the actual <laughs> meeting. We, we so the much Mets fan, Mets, so far, yeah. Mets fans know exactly well, the caliber of players that the A's pushed away when you have to face Matt Olson and Sean Murphy all the time in division. They let that guy go. Not they fair. Him away. Not fair at all. Yeah. yeah. So back to the actual meetings. We spend so much time talking about them, covering them, talking about rumors. I wanted to ask you a player's perspective. What are the meetings like as a player who's a free agent? And on the flip side, what are the meetings like as a player under contract with the team, waiting to hear who they might add, how that could impact your role, and then, frankly, what could happen to your teammates and friends in the game? Yeah, it's exciting. It's such a compact. Usually there's a lot of action going on. It's not as top-heavy as, as this year's free agent class. And, I mean, it's so crazy with Otani is special, obviously – the best baseball player we've ever seen, in my opinion, uh, and in most people's opinion, I think. You have Soto, who's available via trade, and Yamamoto coming over from Japan. There's just not as much action going on, so I think some of it is a little bit slow. But as a player that's a free agent, slow is okay because you know those top guys, are they're waiting to see where they can allocate their budget. And so you want it to start to fall uh, quicker, the better, especially a guy like me. Like I'm a bullpen guy. Most teams wouldn't. I'm not. <laughs> if they get Otani, they're not suddenly going to gonna not sign me. You know what I mean? Or, or vice versa. Uh, so it never really affected me that way. But it does. It's very. You, you, you're in constant contact with your agent during this the winter meetings because you never know at any hour, two in the morning, three in the morning, I've seen crazy things happen in the middle of the night. So this is definitely action packed as far as emotions go. And then when you're a free agent, like if, or when you're already on the team, like with the Mets um, or Yankees, like as a ball player, you, you're curious where these guys are gonna go. As for me, like if I were still with the Mets, is Otani going to be on my team or is he going to be in Atlanta and I have to face this lefty? So I think Brooks Raley's very tuned in. All these guys are tuned in. Um, and, it, and it's a sign that like if you're a young player uh, like on the Mets, DJ Stewart, are they going to go out and sign a Michael A. Taylor to take some time out from you? I mean, he's not – guys like that aren't tuned in, but they're paying attention to, to where – these at bats are going to be allocated. Uh, how many at bats are available for guys that are on the roster, not on the roster? So it's guys are tuned in one way or the other. You're right about the top heaviness of this market. When you think about an Otani, obviously how great he is, but he's also going to get like five hundred and fifty million dollars. So the Dodgers, the Cubs, the Blue Jays, all the teams that are in on Otani they aren't doing a darn thing until they figure out if they have $550 million allocated to one player or not. And the same at a smaller scale, but still a big scale on Yamamoto. The teams that are in there aren't going to act on other important starting pitchers when they know they might be committing $275 million to Yamamoto next week. 
Uh, so I think that plays a role. Let's move to some uh, listener questions from Steve Dot Miller on YouTube. For you, Jerry, for my fellow Ohio native, did you enjoy the free agent process and hearing from teams, or was it something you didn't like and wanted to get over with? I loved it, man. I love all aspects uh, of free agency, of of arbitration. I enjoyed uh, any anybody at SNY knows, uh, including Jeff, who's who's behind the scenes with us here. Uh, I ask so many questions. I want to know how things work. I, I'm the kid that took things apart, you know, just to see if I could put it back together. The free agent process is a fascinating one, um, and it was good for me because as a lefty bullpen, Steve uh steve dot miller which is cool uh the only teams that wanted me were contenders so it was pretty good if you're in the middle of the pack you're not gonna spend above league minimum to get a lefty specialist um unless you're trying to win it so it was fun for me seeing who was out there who appreciated my what i brought to the table and it was you know if you're you're looking for billboard material so if your agent says no they don't think you're as good as good enough or you know this team really wanted you it gives you a little bit of a boost and sees where to see where you are in the market it's pretty special because baseball doesn't lie like your numbers are your numbers your projections are one thing but do you produce and uh it's teams value that and it's it's a fun process it's stressful one year i didn't sign so really late and all my other uh, friends that are also lefties are like dude just sign I'm like I'm I'm being patient, so it's it's fun, but it's definitely stressful. That patience rewarded you was fine, right? <laughs> it's fair, <laughs> true. Yeah. From Dan Siegel on Facebook. So, based on all the comments from Stearns regarding Alonzo, is it safe to assume they aren't going to try and lock him up before the season starts? I don't know how I feel. What do you, What do you think, Jerry? Is it safe to assume they're not going to try? I don't think it's ever safe to do anything uh, when it comes to assumptions, especially with a smart mind like like David Stearns. I think he's going to try. Um, you're going to put something out there uh, because he, Pete Alonso is a he's unique. There's they don't build him like that very much anymore. Just a absolute cleanup hitter like it, that doesn't exist. A power hitting first baseman like that going into free agency. They know what it's going to take. It's going to take something crazy to sign him up. They're they're going to try if they value him. If if over the the process they come with something, I so I don't think it's likely because he's so close to free agency and spending that kind of money when you don't have to quite yet. It's not like they don't they can't sign him back. Um, but I would. I, it's never safe to assume anything. I suspect they will try. I suspect they're not going to be able to get a deal done. Like you said, he is less than 12 months from free agency. He has Scott Boris as his agent. With that said, I fully expect Pete Alonso to be a New York Met for the long term. We're just going to have to deal with kind of this annoyance for another year or so. And hopefully, you know, at next winter meetings, we could actually get, uh, get a deal done. So next one we have from Matt Merton on YouTube. What are the chances Yamamoto beats Cole's total amount record of 324 million? He, he talked about reports of 300 million. If those are accurate, it's not really all that far off. Jerry, I understand where Yamamoto's at, and I, certainly I don't disagree with anything that you and Steve said earlier. I can't imagine that Yoshinobu Yamamoto is about to get the biggest pitcher contract in the history of the sport. Is he? <laughs> <laughs> He's in a perfect situation to do it. Yeah. Uh, I would be shocked because he hasn't done it on the highest level. J Japanese baseball is great. It is elite. Uh, it's different, though. Uh, I think Singa's success uh, really, really opens up the door for this. The separator is this guy has been Garrett Cole, but he's also 25. There are huge question marks, but there is nobody like him on the market right now. And there are all the big teams basically going to be bidding to get to that. I think he does get it. I honestly do. I don't, I would be very hesitant to give it to him, but he's also in a perfect situation, the perfect storm of all the big teams need this guy. They all need it. And him being so young allows for, a. you're not giving it. It's not like the, the, when the Tigers signed 
um, Miguel Cabrera or the Angels signed um, Albert Pujols, this guy hasn't even reached his physical you know peak yet, and he's been elite for you know a half a century or a half a decade already. So. I, <laughs> For the guy that did for a guy that's did it in the ML, MLB for a while, it would be kind of a hard pill to swallow that he beats Garrett Cole, who is the best pitcher in baseball right now. Um, but I see, I think it's going to happen. If I had to put money down uh, on yes or no, I think he, I think he does beat Garrett Cole. That's a great question, by the way. But I do, I do think he beats Garrett Cole's record. And is it that is that the Matt Merton that played for the Cubs and in Japan for a little bit? I don't yeah. think so. This is this spelling. is an M E R. He was M U R. But that's yeah, true. It's crazy. To, as it's well. crazy, crazy to think it is a possibility that we're talking about this. Like you said, maybe some hesitancy, but you really don't want to be facing Yamamoto either on another team. Uh, let's go to Adam Capel Capel on on YouTube. Interesting one. Why hasn't Ronnie Mauricio been brought up in the DH conversation? He's right now really just kind of lumped in with it might just be him versus Brett Beatty competing for third base. Do you think Mauricio should enter the DH conversation? Because frankly, there there are questions about his defensive profile and maybe a little less so about the bat. Uh, I don't think he should be put in that profile yet. He's too athletic and too young to just be a, a bat only. And his... He doesn't I'm the only kind of guys I think that that should do that are the guys that can't play defense. The you know, you you look out like a Kyle Schwarber, um a JD da uh, Drew, not JD Davis. He he did all right defensively in San Francisco anyway. But guys that that have proven that they can't be a DH. So uh, I think Mauricio's value is still too unknown for him defensively. I think he still has a lot of room to grow. Uh, I think that's why uh, he hasn't been talked about there yet. I think he's just he's too he's too physically gifted to be a D a DH. So, well, Jerry, I want to thank you for stepping in for Connor. You certainly did more than an admirable admirable job, and uh, I filled in for Connor. So you filled in for me. I filled in for Connor. I think that's that's the way we're gonna go with it. So, Jerry, <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for uh, joining, and it, it was a blast to, to shoot stuff with you and Steve tonight. Thank you, and thank you to uh, all the guys that or all the, the viewers that, that tuned in and gave us questions. We appreciate it. This is the Mets Pod presented by Tri-State Cadillac. Elevate your style in a Cadillac. Go from bold to bolder in an SUV, from inspiring to awe-inspiring in a sedan. Visit your Tri-State Cadillac dealer today. And remember to subscribe to the show at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SNY's YouTube channel, or wherever you get your podcasts. Connor and I will be back tomorrow night at 8 o'clock. So check out for the last night of winter meetings. And thank you all. Have a great night. Thank you, guys.